that's nice. Okay, I never yeah. did that before. Okay. <laughs> that's a warning. It's a warning. <laughs> Too late for that. Uh, okay. Um, can I start out with uh, Will? You want to introduce who's with you today? Sure. I think you might need to click that continue button. Where's that? On our end. Okay. Um, Will Harris from Baltimore. Um, I, guess I mentioned earlier, we're actually on vacation, so we're calling for about <coughs> Maryland today. Um, but I'm here with Jody and Mike and another one of our students, John, who's slightly off camera. One <laughs> more, okay. <laughs> Gotta go move the furniture. Get, get rid of the table. Then you can. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Okay, uh, Vince is next, I guess. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vinny DiBella. You can tell I'm from New York. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I've been with uh, Sensei Kirby, I would say, since I believe, sir, what, 2008, 2009? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. And um, it's. Uh, it would be nice to get back into some kind of program. If that's possible in the future, I'm sure it will be, Sensei. I'm hoping for that, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, next, uh, Sensei Dave. Yes, um, Dave Clark. Uh, I, don't, I will freely admit I'm, I live in the great state of Florida. <laughs> Good for you. Good, Great governor. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the brunt of many jokes and uh, well-deserved uh, at that. Anyways, uh, I've had the good fortune of uh, work, working with uh, Sensei uh, George Kirby uh, since uh, around 2003, I believe. Uh, and um, uh, the time flies way too fast. Yes. But, uh, I, I, I'm happy to feel like I'm learning at warp speed, even though I'm probably a very average student. <laughs> okay. Chris. Chris Kadamian, uh, Burbank, California. California. <laughs> And um, we just got back from Florida, actually. We were, they were in your neck of the woods last week. So enjoyed the cheap gas prices there compared to what we're paying out here. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't believe it. <laughs> okay, and next is Jan. Um, Janet Chennault, a medical software developer, started doing martial arts when I was about nine, but I haven't been nearly as diligent as the rest of you guys have. Uh, so it's been off and on. Sensei, I started taking from you in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Early at 70s. The y. Yeah, at the early 70s at the Y. Yeah. Yeah, at the Y in Burbank. I'm, I also live uh, in Santa Clarita, California, not too far from where Sensei is. And I have started a martial arts practice at my house two weeks ago, but not for jujitsu. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, Gary. Hi, gosh. So, um, yeah, I grew up hard scrabble in Detroit. <laughs> Went through a lot of hard scrabble in Detroit. Uh, I've done a lot of um, modern ideas. Really attracted me because the stick movement teaches the hand movements, and all the body movements are there. It's all great. But so I posed the question, though, how do you deal with aggressive and passive students? Right. And that's our first topic. That was so I posed that. Let me elaborate that just a little bit, because there are people who play the defense game. So I played the defense game. Right. I played all the defense and counter moves. Um, it took me 10 years to learn how to play the offense. So. I'll just raise those two as what I've, there you are. I just raise it. Okay, okay. Uh, there's some clarification might be good here. Are we dealing with aggressive students and passive students or are we dealing with passive aggressive students? Uh, I don't know that next, that's a little too fine for me. So aggressive students say, you took me down, so I'm gonna poke you in the eye. Okay. Or they're just gonna try, I'm going to try and punch you as hard as I can. That's a great passive. You can't get them to move. Yeah. Move your feet, move your butt, move, move your feet and your body. And, you know, defensive is, um, you know, so defensive, you play the defense game, which is a counter punching, counter move, 
as opposed to the offense where the other guy is passive. And so now you've got to move in. Um, that's kind of how I think about it. Okay. I, I, <clears throat> I thought the question we're talking with aggressive versus passive students, um, I look at it as, as the aggressive student who is um, either in, I'm going to add the word consistently, either intentionally or unintentionally uh, using excessive force, um, running a high risk of injuring another student in practice. Uh, a passive student, on the other hand, is like trying to move a wet piece of spaghetti <laughs> uh, yeah. they, they're, or, they're, or, they, or they just uh how do you say it um they lack i, I put up they lack the self-confidence to try to change or do something uh, that that was really the motivation for my question you've got it exactly yeah and that's what i figured you were talking you've got these two different kinds of students how how do and that's so maybe that's the question how do we deal with an aggressive student or how have you dealt with aggressive students and how do you or how have you dealt with passive students um so are are we all clear on the the definition of a passive and a definition of pass of aggressive we're not gonna, yes we're not going to deal with the passive aggressives uh, <laughs> that's not fair. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I deal with, Sensei. Passive aggressive, where you shake your hand and they hit you in the mouth. And anyway, <laughs> uh, oh gosh, don't tell me about it. So anyway, um, which which I it's a side issue. I I never tell. I tell my students always. Never shake hands with someone you don't trust because most people are right-handed. And when you shake hands, your right hand is trapped. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I consider it, how do you say, high on the stupid list. But let's get back to passive and aggressive. So let's start with uh, uh, Will. You want to start with Will or you want to start with Vinny or who, who'd like to start, I guess. I, I don't know if I had too much experience with people that were too passive. Um, other than they just need the time to gain confidence and, and work through it. We have had from time to time people that were too aggressive and we, it depends on, on the person you're talking about too. If, you're, if it's a lower rank being too aggressive and just doesn't know better, that's one thing. You can, you can kind of train that out of them, I think, usually by talking to them. If you've got a higher rank or a Dan Grade who's being too aggressive and wants to prove that his technique works and is slamming people through the floor or risking injury, that's a whole other conversation. I've had that conversation with one or two students over the years. Um, it gets to the point where nobody wants to work with them anymore, so it's, it's bad for everybody. Um, most times, the conversations were received pretty well and, and they, they change where they're doing things, but it, over time, they end up falling back into those same old habits and that keep reminding them. But if you've got somebody who doesn't change or isn't willing to listen to it, I think you just keep it your own door and not welcome them back anymore. Okay. A anyone else want to? Jump in on aggressives. The um, <clears throat> the the uh, black belts in the class need to be vigilant and need to be in constant to be need to be constantly aware of what you know what's going on. And you can you can you can spot immediately who's going to be too aggressive, who's going to try to prove themselves at other people's expenses expense you know you we can see that immediately we can even feel it as soon as they come on to the mat you know who to watch out for and as long as uh you know the senseis are or assistant senseis are you know mindful of that then you can put a you can put a nip in, nip in it immediately but you have to take them off the mat very nicely explain to them in a very you know respectful way and that's the first step we have to be vigilant because someone can get hurt immediately, very quickly. Okay, uh, Janet? So I can speak of this, both sides of that equation. 
um, in the first person. I learned from Sensei uh, back in the, we've just established 1970s, that the best style of fighting was that you wait for your, the person you're confronting to make some sort of an aggressive move and then you help them fall on their face. Mm. Um, and that was something I was very comfortable with at the time. Uh, since then, I joined what most people realize I've, on this call already. I do medieval martial arts, which is quasi full contact. And as a result of going into that with the very counter punching philosophy, I died like a dog for the first two and a half years because in a, um, in a sport that is full contact, especially when my opponents look a whole lot much more like you guys than they look like me, uh, there's not many women doing it. Um, the only way you can fight against somebody who is far more experienced and stronger than you are is to dive down their throat um, and to become very aggressive. And it took me two and a half years to learn that. Now, back in the new millennium, I rejoined jujitsu. And I've had a lot of trouble because if it's a, just a planned technique and we're going through it, no trouble. But when Sensei does some of his drills where people take me by surprise, or when I get into a very competitive environment, especially against some of the black belts, um, I turn on. And I, I, I know that since he's probably had um, some concerns about this, because I know that I have, uh, I don't have the rear stat, right? The, the adrenaline from doing 40 years of broadsword fighting um, kicks in and immediately I try to pit tear some really nice people apart. Um, so, um, and so Will, when you were saying take them aside and talk to them, as you can see, I'm aware of this. And what I don't have is that control mechanism. You know, I, I don't want to get rid of what I've learned doing the broadsword fighting because God knows I need it right? Um, but what I need is the ability to turn it down, you know, 20% maybe, when yeah. I'm dealing with jujitsu. And I don't have an, a technique for that. So if somebody has some advice, it'll probably not only be um, useful to the senseis present, but um, it'll also be very useful to me personally. Yeah, you got to find a way to be able to control it. That's the whole key to everything. Like you can be a, a badass and go, as you said a few weeks ago, rip somebody's head off, but you don't want to go at that speed all the time. So to me, slow and controlled is way more impressive than fast and sloppy. So we, we, we teach slow a lot. And as far as like lower ranks, we actually always had a saying in our dojo, like protect yourself from the white belts. You don't know what they're going to do. You, you, they fit in, you throw yourself. Um, just to make sure, one, they feel how it's supposed to go, and two, you don't hurt yourself or get hurt. But yeah, it, that's, as an advanced rank, you've got to be able to control and turn it, turn that aggressiveness on and off. Okay. Let me, I understand that, some let me, trouble. Yeah. Let me, let me add something in here so we don't segue too much from the original intent of the topic. Uh, sure. what, what Jan is referring to, you know, and, and shit, as she said, it took her three years, two or three years to develop this sense of aggressiveness. Um, and we also say, you know, if you have to defend yourself, you do what is necessary to defend yourself. And both of those fall in line completely with each other. Uh, you do what you have to do. And I know when uh, teaching jiu-jitsu for me, and I've taught also, you know, self, self-defense classes, which I call counter-assault training, uh, the hardest thing to get people to do is to be, to aggressively defend themselves. I don't know if that's a contradiction, but to, because they're afraid of hurting the other person. And there, there is a very fine line there. 
uh, between practice and actually racking a person up. But the attitude that Janet is saying is, is Jan, you're okay. <laughs> you're where you should be. You're probably, you know, I, I, the control is something you will develop. Yeah, well, why is it then that the upper belts always kind of wince when they are chosen to, to work with me? <laughs> because they, they, you know, okay, they, they know that they are, I don't want to say, I don't want to say they know they're going to get a whooping, but they know, <laughs> they, they know that you aren't going to fool around with them. And I know in my previous, if I had to work with, with a student who was, you know, who was fairly confident in himself, I had to know, I need to, I'm not going to fool around with this person as much. They're going to do the technique. I need to be aware so that I can tap out early enough so that I don't get hurt, things of that sort. Um, but, but that's where you want, I think, ideally where you want your students to be. If, if you're in the process of being attacked, we, we say we're learning to defend ourselves, which we are doing. But in defending ourselves, we are also being aggressive. I have never seen a... a, a a defender who has won anything simply by defending. You have to, I say, put yourself out there and do what you can either to protect, protect your position or prevent the other person from hurting you. Um, and that's to an extent aggression, even though we're saying we're only defending ourselves. But what I think we're trying to deal with here is, is the student who is aggressive in the dojo not necessarily the aggressiveness that we may, uh, 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 jujitsu or any martial artist might display in defending themselves from an assault. And those are two. Those are two. Those are two different ball games. One is one is in the, the learning process, and the other one is okay. If I don't do something here, I'm going to get my teeth knocked out. And those are two entirely different situations. And we're talking about, we're talking about the student's attitude, the aggressive, aggressive student to me is, is a person who is, uh, they're using too much force in what they're doing in the dojo and the, the risk of injury to other students is high. And yeah, then, and maybe I misunderstood, but I thought Janet was describing herself as that student, as yeah. that student maybe too aggressive in class. I don't, I don't think Jan is. <laughs> Well, that's because I, I thought I, I I I did characterize myself like that. No, I no I I I, I think it's just Jan's skills kick in because she knows that's what she has to do to survive the situation. The same applies in any street quote unquote self defense situation. You have to do certain things that you might not normally do in dealing with another person in order to protect yourself, keep yourself alive, to keep yourself from getting hurt. And as long as you can justify it, hopefully in a court of law if necessary, you're okay. I mean, if, if, uh, if, uh, who can I pick on here? If, uh, yeah, pick on me. No, 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 no. <laughs> if, if, uh, let me do a, a find a stereotype here. If, uh, okay, I'll just take on the news last night. There's a, I don't know, I think it was in LA someplace. Uh, some lady was pumping gas and, uh, some, uh, a gentleman who weighed in excess of 300 pounds just came over and started attacking her. And it was all caught on video. Um, could she have defended herself? I don't know, but you have to, the adrenaline kick, you have to protect yourself. And the purpose of martial arts training is to train you to be quote unquote aggressive to protect yourself from injury. It's, it's you know, it's, that's, that's why Seki said, you don't fight people, you help them. <laughs> so, 
I want to thank Janet yeah. for your medieval martial arts. I work with the, in Ann Arbor, we have a group, the Ring of Steel. It's all sorts of medieval martial arts. What time do you do it? You know, what decade do you do it? So, hey, it's great to meet somebody else who, who works in the medieval martial arts world. Very cool. Thank you. Sensei, if I may. Uh, Sensei Kirby? Yes. I Going back to what was said before, I, I also agree that some of the most, and unintentionally, of course, but some of the most dangerous, quote unquote, students are your, your white belts and your green belts, you know, because they, they don't have the touch. They don't have the control. They don't know as you're joint dampening, you're, you're tightening up on someone's, uh, you know, body. They don't know the feel of when to stop. Okay. So it, and that comes with practice. And again, I go back to, it's up to us when, you know, the, the black belts are observing, we need to even see that even though we can't feel, you know, the UK's pain, we could, we can, we'll, we'll see it and we'll tell that white belt or green belt, Hey, you know, you, you know, because sometimes people don't tap. They don't say mate for some reason, either they're scared or they don't know what to say, you know, so we have to say that for them. So again, it's up to observation by the black belts or, or some of the upper students to, you know, remind the, uh, the, the Tory who's only a, a white belt or a green belt or what have you to let, to let go or to stop the, 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 uh, the kata or the waza. Okay, let's let's let. Uh, I want to let Chris, Chris has been quietly <laughs> contemplating the state of the world here. Uh, and let you get a couple of words in, then we'll get Dave in, then I, I want to make some comments here. So Chris, go go for it. So as far as aggressive students, um, the way we have things structured, at least the way I teach, is I think of it as buckets. You know, like there's different different times and areas where you do different things. Um, you know, so in, a, in an environment, because we have basically solo training, partner training, and then we have a randori situation where you have multiple people coming at you at the same time. And, and so during solo training is when we try to instill, you know, a lot of these things that, that have been discussed. When they get into partner training, and there's some parts of it that are pre-arranged and, and we focus on that. And then when we get into Randori training, basically it's almost like anything goes, of course, you know, with, with some rules, but, but um, as far as, you know, an aggressive student, you usually see that as, as has been mentioned at the lower ranks, right? So when they start, and it's, it's because they're trying to force something to happen that's not happening, right? Either the technique is not working for them, they're having issues, so they try to force it through. And we monitor things pretty pretty well. So when we see that, generally an instructor will step in and say, okay, let's you know try it on me, basically. And of course it doesn't, you know, it, it's hard for them to be aggressive against, you know, one of the instructors and, and have them, you know, make that work. So it puts things into perspective. There's always somebody better than you. There's always somebody bigger and stronger. And so the lesson starts sinking in. Now, in, in partner practice, then you're at the next level, basically. We focus on distance and timing. And that's what we emphasize because what it does is it shifts their, their thinking from defeating the person you know, to trying to coordinate with the person. Um, cause that aggressiveness comes in when you're trying to defeat the person, that competitiveness has, has, has been mentioned, but they need to understand that in that bucket, you're not trying to defeat somebody. So the whole concept of uke and tore is what is the giver and the receiver, which means the giver <laughs> is giving you something for the purpose of helping you either exposing, a, you know, a weakness that you have or, or, you know, something like that. So you, you need to receive that and, and you need to receive that and, and do something with it, you know, in a way that protects yourself. But when, it sh when the mentality shifts to trying to defeat the person, 
you're no longer interested in receiving what the person's giving you. You just want to stop it at the source. Now it's combat. See, it's that's a different bucket. <laughs> so, so in that second category, you know, we we emphasize basically giving and receiving. And, and it's a partnership. It's almost like a dance. Then when we go to Randori in the third bucket, now, you know, you need to be more assertive. Now strategy comes in, you know, a, a, a lot more. But there's a difference between assertive and aggressive, right? Because, again, aggressive is you're kind of on the attack. You're trying to stop something. Assertive is just being super focused. And if you, if, if you make somebody aggressive, the inevitable happens, which is they lose control. And so later that, that spills over into other areas. They don't know how to shut it off because their personality has fundamentally changed or it's been impacted. And this is where the philosophy comes in of the teacher and the dojo is, is no matter what you teach and how you train them, the overlying philosophy of what you're trying to accomplish which is to help each other, you know, has to be consistent in all types of training that you do. Once you get away from that, then, then you can take a bully and make them more dangerous, right? You can make an aggressive person and make them more aggressive. I mean, to some extent, that's what we do in the military in boot camp, right? Because we're training them for a specific purpose. But, you know, the dojo is supposed to be a different environment. So, so that's kind of how we handle it, you know, and if, if somebody, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't really recall having somebody that aggressive. I mean, you have different personalities, but we shut them down pretty quickly. I, I've had people before they signed up, they want to come in and kind of try you, you know, to see if, you know, if you're good enough, if they, if you can defeat them, then they'll learn from you, you know, type mm -hmm. of things. But, but, uh, but the philosophy of helping each other is always there. And then, and then we channel that assertiveness depending on the different training that they're in so that it's not, not just all aggression, not just all cooperation, you know, di different training for, for different kinds of things, basically. And honestly, we haven't really had any issues. I can think of maybe one or two people that just are inherently kind of aggressive type of people but um, but that could be tempered, you know. That could be that could be uh, controlled, and and we haven't you know run into any issues beyond white belt, yellow belt, maybe you know the, the, the lower levels, like most people do. So I don't know if that helps, but that's kind of how we tackle it. Okay, that's, that's a good perspective. You're separating the the aggressiveness from the well, I'm not separating it. Explain the difference between assertive versus aggressiveness, and and you're probably saying you're saying it more accurately than I did. Uh, uh, you know, the aggressiveness has to be there, but you have to control it. Correct. And that's yeah. what, that's what makes you an assertive person uh, in a, in any field in anything is is to con control how forward you are or pushy or whatever you, whatever term you want to use. Uh, whether it be in the business world or on, on the in the dojo, uh, Dave, can we get a few words from you before I comment? Certainly, certainly. I want to thank Janet for putting herself out there. Uh, you offered a, a a great perspective uh, and some some really important insights, and uh, those are valuable, Janet. Thank you. Rich, every time you open your mouth, I get writer's cramp. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, you you brought up some really key points. Um, I really can't uh, embellish much on uh, uh, what what uh, um, Chris said because uh, it's uh, really, really well uh, explained. But I will say this. We focused a lot this morning on aggressive, I noticed. Uh, the passive student, let me address for just briefly, and I'll, 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 I'll go to the others, uh, and I won't be long. Um, with passive students, um, and we've had our, our fair share of them, um, I uh, work with them to uh, allow them, to, pulling them aside and talking to them isn't anything like pulling an aggressive student aside and talking to them. Um, they've already already had a talking to and they know they feel, um, um, you know, weak or inferior or 
Uh, and so what I uh, do is set up situations that allow them to, to build on their small successes. Um, and one of them is the fact that we use consortium teaching. So as soon as they're any kind of rank or they've got enough experience, when somebody comes in the door behind them that has less experience, I put them in a leadership role where they can train that student with the beginning forms, uh, with, with the material they already know and ha have them feel uh, like they're a bit in the driver's seat. And it's amazing how, how, how empowering that, that becomes. Some really respond well, some remain um, you know, passive uh, because um, it's gonna take a lot more than that to, to, to draw them out. Um, as far as the aggressive, um, um, we, we talked earlier, uh, controlled and uh, slower movements in the dojo. Uh, and reminding them that um, uh, the uh, uh, adrenaline flow on the street is going to speed things up. So don't, don't uh, uh, feel this need for speed in the dojo. Uh, uh, controlled and slower is, is what, what we want to do. And uh, uh, catching your uki, really, really big. Uh, I have people who say, you know, they'll throw me and I'll, I'll land really hard. I'll slap hard because I feel myself going down hard. And they'll apologize. But then the next time I get thrown, they they forgot and they and they threw me hard again, and and that person I'll pull aside and you wonder if it's aggression or you wonder if they're just forgetful. Oh, that they're caught up in the moment. It's really important to catch your rookies, um, even on a good math system. And thirdly, um, and developing body awareness, especially uh, during a uh, multiple attacker randori. Uh, uh, we have some students that the elbows and the fists and the feet fly in all directions. And it's like, hold on a second. Uh, there are people that get struck inadvertently, just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, just because there's a, a, a lack of, of their, where their body is in relation to other people's body. And again, that can be fixed by slowing things down. Um, uh, and it can also be fixed by um, having that student uh, uh, work towards uh, being aware that um, their elbows are going places that they're not even aware of. Their fists and their feet are going places, their knees. That's about all I have to say on it. Okay. Um, when, when I've uh, dealt with aggressive students, and, and some things I'll do the same with aggressive as I will with passives. Um, if, if, and I, I'm glad everyone's kind of saying, well, we usually nip this in the bud of the white belt or yellow belt. Because it, it is easy to pick up on these issues early on. Uh, there are some people that come into the class with an attitude, and that has to be dealt with. Um, if I have a student who is being aggressive, overly aggressive, and, and, and I've had it happen where they've inadvertently injured another student, um, I will pull them aside after the injured student is taken care of, et cetera. Uh, I will pull them aside and say, you know, this could have been avoided. You you know, you're being, you know, you're using too much force in this class. Um, you need to be more careful in executing techniques. And I'll usually try and leave it at that. Um, if it happens a second time, which has only happened once, okay, um, I will tell the student, you know, this is your you know, second injury you've caused, uh, this, you're using too much force, you need to make a decision. Um, I want, I would like you to stay in this class, but you have to start controlling what you do. And if you can't say it, if you can't control what you do, then you aren't going to be able to stay in this class. Uh, the, the, the goal here is to put them in, let them make the decision. Whenever you can let students make decisions rather than you as a sensei making a decision that benefits their growth because you know what the decision has to be. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of like when you were kids and your parents said, do this or else, or your parents said to you, you need to decide what to do. And if you figure it out on your own, it usually goes a lot better. But uh, the other option is, is uh, uh, a second time is to simply have the person, you know, get them off the mat and say, unless you can change your attitude or the way you're behaving on the mat, uh, 
you know, you're up, sit, go and sit down until you think you can act accordingly. Um, but you, you can't really cannot fool around too much with an aggressive student. Another thing I will do, which is the same as I will do with a passive student, is if they're doing a technique and they look like they're using a lot of force to do it, because that's aggressive students tend to be quote unquote aggressive. I will have them try the technique on me. Okay. And I will try to get them to do the technique correctly. You're using too much force. You're working too hard. Try it this way and get them to realize that if they do things correctly, they don't need to use as much effort to do what they're doing. Uh, because any, this, you know, your martial arts training is to help you develop control over yourself. Um, and you can do the technique on them too. And as a sensei, I know there are many times where, you know, a student has tried to do a technique and I'll just give them a tough time um, because they're using force. And uh, I mean, that's something we do as sensei. We tend to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of our students. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and when they realize that force isn't going to work, and maybe, I'll, you know, because they're using force, I'll just counter their technique and say, you know, you, you do the technique correctly. And once, they, once you as a sensei feel they're doing the technique correctly, you go along with the technique because that's part of the learning process for them. Um, passive student is almost the same thing, um, except they're not, you know, they're not putting any, I say, I don't want to say they're not putting any effort into what they're doing. They're just afraid they're going to hurt you. Um, and so they, they really are very extremely cautious and it's a matter of giving them some self-confidence. I think what Dave does in terms of having them teach lower ranks is good. You know, it puts them in a position where they have some responsibility and if they can do it well, it improves their self-confidence and their own knowledge of their techniques. Um, but with, with passive students, it takes, it can take a lot of encouragement to get them out from under your wings, so to speak. Um, and it may be, you know, you've got to compliment them. You've got to encourage them. You don't want to baby them. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those teachers that at some point in the teaching career, there's a, there's a big push on self-esteem. And I used to tell my kids, you know, self-esteem is a lot of hot air. Um, <laughs> You either, you know, you can compliment, there's a difference between complimenting a person when they do something right and complimenting them because they're breathing. Um, and, and I don't compliment people because they breathe. That's a natural function. But I, I think if we, you know, it's a matter of helping some of these students believe in themselves that they can do things. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's a, it's a different approach to some extent with a passive student. Um, sometimes it's, it's uh, what we do, one of the things we'll do is uh, starting around the fourth week of class, uh, we start at the end of, end of class, we would uh, have like 10 or 15 minutes where they just come out and be, a, a, even the white belts, fourth week, third or fourth week in the class, they'd be attacked. And the goal, and I, you know, and the goal is not to have them execute a technique beautifully, but the initial goal is to get what, rid of what, what I call a deer in the headlights approach, where they stand there, oh my God, what am I going to do? Their eyes are wide open. Is there anyone who's not familiar with the concept of deer in the headlights? Everyone is good. Okay, and and. That's one of the hardest things to get students through. And it has nothing to do with their skill level in any martial art. It's just, bang, you're attacked. What are you going to do? And um, usually by around week seven or eight, the deer in the headlight approach starts dwindling because they, and their, their, their technique execution or whatever they do may be really crummy, but they're doing something. And you have to compliment them on the fact that they are doing something and they will get, you know, 
It's like your belt ranks. They will get better as they progress in rank on all their techniques. Um, but this helps them develop their self-confidence. And that's, that's one of the things that, how do you say, in anything you do in life, um, any skill you learn improves your self-confidence. Um, this is just, uh, I, we had a, 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 one of the outside doors where the, the doorknob lock jammed completely. Couldn't get in or out with it. And, and I said, you know, am I going to have to call a, a what you call it, a, a locksmith? And I said, no, let me try taking this thing apart, cleaning it up. You know, I have no idea what I was doing, but <laughs> it works beautifully now. Okay. So, so, you know, I'm, you know, I fixed something. And the same thing applies to the martial arts. If they realize they can fix something, it gives them a sense of accomplishment and confidence. And it's like anything else you do in life, they get better at it. And, and so with a passive student, you have to give them the opportunities where they can improve their self-confidence regardless of how you do it. But you don't want to do any, you know, I'm going to give you a trophy because you breathed in class tonight. I, I, I do not like participation trophies because they don't, they don't mean anything. And, and kids, kids know that. They know that at some point in their lives, they, they realize, you know, a 15 year old realizes when he's looking at all these participation trophies on his bookshelf or by his bed. And then there's a, then there's a third place trophy in there. Those participation trophies aren't worth diddly. That third place trophy means a hell of a lot. And, and that's what, that's what we're after is sensei is get them, you know, to where they believe in themselves and not, you know, how do you say it? They have some self-confidence. Anyway, anyone else want to deal with passive students? Anything unique you do with them or? And so you said something that struck a chord that might be worth putting it out there. Um, you're right about self-esteem being a bunch of hoo-ha. Um, it, the reason quite simply is that it's other oriented. Uh, self-esteem involves really how others see you as opposed to its opposite, which is self-perception where real self-confidence real self -confidence, uh, uh, comes from. And uh, working on a student's self-perception uh, will, will, uh, will work magic uh, yeah. because what you're doing is directly influencing how they see themselves rather than how the, how the world sees them. Right, I agree. And that's, where, that's where the real change takes place. So uh, uh, as a teacher, I remind myself often about the importance of developing a, a, a positive, a rich self-perception. And you can do that with genuine heartfelt compliments. Uh, that, that are, are hard earned and well deserved, uh, and and spotting them and calling them out and letting them know. Many of the time, I've had a student who's just about got something. And all I have to do is indicate, "You are really close, You're really close. You got this. Let's go." They do it two or three more times, and they nail it. And sometimes it's the very next time. And all I've done is is, is demonstrated that I have confidence in them based not because of what I think what I see them doing and then it changes their self-perception you can almost see their chest puff out and then they go for it right and that, that, as a teacher man there's no better feeling yeah self-perception oh, uh, and forget self-esteem yeah I mean I've I, I'm going to revert back to the classroom I've, I've had a number of kids that were heavy duty gangbangers in, in public school classrooms and you have to you always have to deal with them in a respectable manner. And this is key for anybody. You, you deal with everyone in a respectable manner. It doesn't matter who they are or what you think of them. Um, and they will at some point realize, they'll confront you at some point. Um, you know, why do you keep giving me lousy grades? Or one kid in class spoke up and said, Kirby, they don't use Mister. But that's you know, I don't worry about the Mister part. Um, I gave up that concept decades ago in the classroom. Um, <laughs> they say, Kirby, why do you keep dissing me? And this kid was in my class. And I simply looked at him and I said, If you'd stop dissing yourself, other people would stop dissing you. And he looks at me, 
And he was quiet the rest of the hour. He actually came up after class and apologized to me, and uh, which I did not expect from him. And uh, he, you know, he turned out earning a C in the class. And, and I've seen this turn up. Sometimes you just have to, if someone gives you a challenge, you can challenge it, you can confront it verbally and turn it around and make them, like you said, look at their own self-perception. And that, that is really the key to helping them develop their self-confidence and, and them improving is, is where they can look at themselves and say, yeah, I really screwed up here. Um, because most, most people know what they have to do to set things straight. You know, human beings are not, human beings are not dumb. Some of us are stupid, but <laughs> we are not dumb. And if, if we get serious, um, we can, um, you know, nine times out of 10, we can resolve our own problems. And I think the same applies to the dojo. Uh, if you give students, if you give students a chance or several chances, sometimes they will ultimately succeed. And that's, that's what you're after. And that, that can help a passive student become more open and, and they sense the accomplishment they're having and it reduces their, how do you say, it improves their self-perception, which improves their self-confidence, as Dave said, and, and they just start growing from there. And that's, that. It, for those of you who are, you know, are all sensitive, that is something that makes all the effort and hassle worthwhile. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, Jan. I just want to point out that you paraphrased um, Musashi, uh, who said that the martial artist can learn from the potter and the sandal maker, and apparently as well from the locksmith. Yes. <laughs> apparently what? As well from the locksmith. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we many times we set up our own barriers to learning or success. And the same thing happens with students, whether they be passive or aggressive. They set up their own barriers. And once you get them to realize that they have control over their barriers, um, you've won and they've won. And that's, that's the key is, you know, as, as Dave said and others, you've said, if they can develop their, some sense of self-confidence, they don't have to be as aggressive or they don't have to be passive. It's a lot of it, I think, is really under their, their own self-control if they're in an environment that allows them to develop that. Gary. So overly aggressive is part of that whole uncertainty, just like being overly passive. I don't know how to do this. Overly aggressive is I have to try so hard. It's the same problem on both sides. Great session. Thank you. Yeah, it is. It's the same. You're right. It's the same. They, 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 they put up a barrier and your job as a sensei is to help them break down that barrier. And you help them break down that barrier by building up their self-confidence. And, and that's, that's the hardest thing for anyone to do. You know, uh, if, if you're a parent, you've been through this battle so many times, you can write a book, several books. <laughs> uh, if, if you're an employer, you know, if you're a sensei, if you're the president of the United States, you, you, <laughs> you've, you've got to, you know, that's your responsibility is to help people get over their barriers. Yes, sir. So I think it is conquering fear. The really aggressive people that I've dealt with were just really afraid, and that made them be so aggressive. And the really passive people were afraid. It's conquering fear. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. Um, and, and anyway, so um, anything else we want to do with this student? Be this before we, now that we've gotten the 
passive and aggressive student to behave in the dojo. <laughs> and uh, one, one, one thing I will say, and this is, uh, uh, is that many times they, whether they're aggressive or passive, and as Gary said, part of their fear is that they are not performing up to whatever standard they perceive they should be at or the sense they think the sense they believe they should be at. And one of the things I always stress with my students is uh, you're learning, you're learning a whole bunch of jujitsu techniques. Okay. You're not ever going to be good at all of them. Okay. You're going to find some that work really well for you, and that's what you will perfect as part of your, of your personal repertoire. That's okay. When you're testing, I'm not looking for green belt, I'm not looking for perfection in any techniques. I have a person who I, I just tested um, by video. He just got through second round. We're going to do the first round as, as a Zoom Zoom testing, by, and I'm curious as to how that goes because it'll probably be a lot easier on both of us in the process I now use for video testing. Um, but I said, to him, you know, and he's trying so hard to be perfect, and I said, don't. I said, I'm a tenth grade black belt. I'm still learning how to do stuff perfectly. I said, it's a process you get better. And once they realize that they don't have to be perfect, that all you're looking for, and this is what, and, on when, and I'm sure, I hope so, unless I'm on a different boat going in a different direction. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think what we look at when we test a student is improvement in what they're doing. Um, yeah, I expect a person testing for, for first brown belt to do a, a, a Koshinagi a lot better than I do a, a white belt who's testing for green. And the same is for any other technique. You're expecting a much higher level of performance. But is it perfection? Eh, I don't know. You know, but, but it's, it's part of that helps them reduce their fear of, of becoming better. Because some people will say, I can't do this as well as sensei, I'm going to give up. And, and sensei's been on the mat for 54 years. You've been on the mat for three months. You know, get, I don't want to say get real or get a life, but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something, you know, it, it's a hard students to accept that, that you're not looking for, you know, you're not looking for perfection, you're looking for them to get better. And for whether the student is passive or aggressive, that's probably their same concern. You know, the, the passive student doesn't try because they don't think they can do it. The, the aggressive student thinks they've tried so hard that they can't, but they still can't do it. And the reality is they're both facing the same problem. The fear of perfection. Or there's, a, there's, a, there's a valid... Um analogy here i'm talking with um, students uh each one of us goes back and remembers when we first started learning uh we, we each of it each one of us used a lot of extra wasted form to get these techniques to quote work and then as we developed a comfort with them and a familiarity with them we could relax and we could use relaxed coordination instead of extra wasted force and uh, that's where the that's where the confidence can really set in. Right. But it's, it, I mean, it, and even even the most natural of uh, 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 in any endeavor uh, still start out uh, quote trying too hard because it's it's inevitable. Uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna try to force it. We're gonna as opposed to learning that you can with with practice develop coordination and control. Then that you only use the amount of force that's necessary, and no more. But yeah, it, 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 that's how you develop speed and facility in, in any endeavor. Yeah, I mean, I I will tell my students, uh, you know, the, the harder you try in here, the more difficult the task will become. 
And then I even when I talk economics, <laughs> the harder you try in this class, the harder you become a man, the more difficult the task will become. Um, you know, so stop trying. Uh, <laughs> just just do what you can. Um, and most of them can do very well. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, we, we, we try so hard at the beginning, we're, we're using all that extra energy for no, for no purpose um, because we think we have to. Um, it's, and it's like, I'm sure many of you know as sensei, um, sometimes you, and you, you've done it, if you've had kids, you've also done this. If you, particularly if you've had more than one kid or you've, you know, you've dealt with other kids before you have your own kids, um, you know what's going to happen. If a kid puts himself in a situation, you know what is going to happen. You know what the outcome is going to be. Even on the mat with a new student, they're trying a technique, they're doing it wrong. You know what's going to happen. Sometimes you just have to, and I did this in the classroom, you know, whether it be in the dojo classroom, you have to let them make mistakes. As long as they're, they're as long as they're not endangering their partner or themselves, um, because once they realize that what they're doing isn't working, then they're more receptive to what will work, and uh, and that's part of their gr growth process as well. And to help them develop their self confidence, is you have to let them you have to let them make mistakes. And that's a hard, sometimes that's the hardest thing for a parent or a sensei to do is to let your kids, your students make mistakes because you want them to do it. What's the magic word? Right. Right. Okay. Or because I'm left handed, I usually say to students, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I use the word correct rather. Than, I use the word correct too. Are you left handed? <laughs> I'm left-handed and I use the word correct. Right. <laughs> correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> See, us left-handed people have a lot of idiot syncrasies. Anyway. Because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes if you're giving directions to a student to do something, and they say, do you want me to go left or right? If you say, go right, and they say right, and then you say right again, you know, they don't know whether it's right or correct. So if you, say, you want me to go to the right, you say correct. And then they know that that one <laughs> right is the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sensei, I can't finish many of your sentences, but I can finish that one. I had the word correct coming out of my mouth as you did. <laughs> Sensei, I just want to add uh, something too, um, in that, um, you know, getting somebody to think through things a little bit differently is, is part of the big challenge I think all, let's say, good dojos have. Because, um, you know, in our culture, everything is based on kind of short-term, short-term results, quick results, and things like that. So, so when somebody, going back to an aggressive student sometime, it's short thinking you know, saying, let me push through this and, and defeat this person, you know, where, where what we're teaching the philosophy really is much more long term. So, so even in a combat situation, you can't just think about defeating the first person, there might be a lot more people behind that, that you're going to have to deal with. So, so thinking in, a, in the bigger picture long term, will automatically set up the person to think about their energy, their resources, you know, and allocating that properly because there's a lot more for them to deal with than just this one situation in front of them. Because the more they kind of force their way, you know, for that one single purpose of what they see in front of them, and, and you probably see them, we've all seen it, technique starts falling apart. You know, the more aggressive the student pushes, you know, something. Uh, and that's why when you were saying, <laughs> just stop trying, because the harder you try, the, the less it's going to work. Well, because they're abandoning technique along the way. And, and, and they're putting all their energy, you know, without the technique or less technique to defeat this one person. But if you can put them against multiple people and say, you got to deal with all these problems, not just this one problem, 
Of course, you still have to deal with it one at a time, but knowing that there's more behind that, you know, will get them to think, okay, if I explode here and waste all my energy here, you know, then I'm not going to have enough for the second one or the third one. And it doesn't even have to be in concept. You can try that out very easily and find that you'll be out of breath in, in, in 30 seconds, you know, and, and not have enough, uh, you know, energy left to deal with the other issues. So, you know, the training and the philosophy need to, you know, need to mesh, you know, a little bit and, and that common lesson and that common, you know, theme needs to exist in all types of different training that they do. Uh, otherwise, it's like, okay, you got to be polite here, but you can cuss here, you know, and you can, you know, do this here and it's all different. And it, it, it's not connected for them. So anyway. Chris, that was a great point. I'd like to bring that up next time because I think it takes longer than the last five minutes that we've got. Right, I've got to go. My horse is winning at me and I have to put a brake controller in my car today. So long. <laughs> thank you, Jen. Okay, thank you, Jen. Uh, Gary, I, I think we're, 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 we're Chris. I uh, want to compliment you. You really tied a number of things together there and uh, uh, I really want to compliment you on, on how you how you did that. It was uh, uh, this is a great thing. Yeah, it's great. Uh, gosh, I wish we were closer, but we're all spread out over the country. But Chris brought up some great points that I want to bring up. I'll try and figure them out. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes. Um,